As we work towards our hybrid content for the Titan V Voltic card, we're now looking at clock scaling. So how does the game and synthetic performance change as we scale the HBM versus the core clock? Basically answering the question of which one matters more for these couple of applications we're testing today. And although the Titan V, which runs on Volta, may not have the next gen gaming architecture in its final form because it is ultimately a compute card for scientific workloads and things like that, it can still teach us about NVIDIA's direction, which thus far with this card we've learned appears to be targeting async compute and lower level API optimization. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus 3120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake ring fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. So this test is pretty straightforward. All we're doing is testing multiple different core and HBM clock combinations. We're doing that with EVGA Precision, which works actually really well with this card, even though they didn't even release a build for it. And we're running with the fan at 100% for all tests just to eliminate that overheating variable from the equation. This is also done with 120% power offset. So these tests, we have the most data for with synthetics. That's precisely what synthetics are built for, 3D Mark and Superposition primarily. And then we also have Sniper Elite, Ashes of the Singularity, and Destiny 2 as real gaming benchmarks. The reasons we chose these are because for Destiny 2, we saw very little scaling compared to the Titan XP in some instances. And we think that's because we were becoming ROPS bound as the ROPS on this card are the same count as on the previous 10 series cards at the high end. For Ashes of the Singularity, we saw a middle step of performance. It was 10-ish percent over the Titan XP. And for Sniper, we saw massive gains over the previous architecture because it's asynchronous compute enabled and it's a lower level DirectX 12 API, which Ashes is as well, but it behaves differently. So that gives us a full suite of what we can expect to see from the card under various conditions. And if you want the full details on testing, you can click the link in the description below to the article. But let's just dive in with Sniper and towards the end, we'll have a lot more data for the synthetic workloads. So we're just starting with the polar opposites for the games. As we know, games will interest most of you more than synthetics, and also games will have the least change as opposed to more sensitive synthetics. For Sniper Elite 4, we observed a slightly more beneficial impact from just HBM overclocking, indicated by 129.6 FPS average and marginally increased lows versus 125.2 FPS average. This shows a 3.5% increase from doing just HBM2 overclocking versus just the core overclock. Overclocking either one standalone is still getting us a noteworthy jump over the stock Titan V, minimally 8.7%, but overclocking both has the most impressive gains, jumping up to 142 FPS average. It's almost as if the core and HBM overclocks stack, so to speak, in this particular title, and that makes sense. Remember that Sniper Elite 4, again, uses asynchronous compute, low-level APIs, and leverages components more heavily, especially extra shaders. This, we think, is an indicator of where NVIDIA is going with its future gaming architecture, whatever that may be. It will likely be a Volta derivative, but won't be Volta in its current form. In Ashes of the Singularity with DirectX 12, we're observing clock scaling and HBM scaling almost equally. The increased core clock helps a bit more in frame time consistency, but doesn't move the average in a meaningful way versus just the increased HBM clock. These are functionally the same. Again, overclocking both provides a noteworthy gain, about 5% over the individual component overclocks, but doing one or the other shows what we're seeing here. Destiny 2 showed some of the least scaling in our original test, which is a mix of its DirectX 11 API and more importantly, a potential ROPS limitation. With Destiny 2, we observed marginally higher performance with just an HBM overclock at 2.6% boosted over the core only overclock. Overclocking both the core and HBM gave us another 8% over the core only OC. And here's what we observed in Firestrike Ultra. For this one, we saw just the core overclocks generally providing greater uplift with a change of 86, 86 points for the core only to 84, 34 points for the memory only. The difference is a boost of about 3% for core over memory only overclocking in Firestrike Ultra. Overclocking both to 200 megahertz offset gets us to 90, 26 points, where we're observing diminishing returns versus the 175 megahertz HBM2 offset and even 150 megahertz HBM2 offset. It would appear that the final 25 megahertz of HBM clock isn't really doing a lot for us or that we're becoming bound to somewhere else in the architecture. 
that may be quark lock, but this is behavior we also saw with Vega, where at some point you start becoming bound elsewhere and the memory clocks don't do as much as they did at the lower end. Finally, superposition shows more gains from the core than the memory only overclocks, but not by much. The difference is about 1.5%. We don't run into diminishing returns as hard with this one as we did with Firestrike, as the 175 megahertz offset, the 150 megahertz offset, and even the 100 megahertz HBM2 offset all show somewhat comparable scaling in performance. Our 100 megahertz core and 200 megahertz HBM2 offsets also show a slight gain over core only or HBM only overclocking and further illustrates that there's a bit more headroom to boost performance in this particular application. Generally speaking, it looks like a core overclock minimally helps a bit more than HBM overclocking in some of these tests and it kind of worst case, they do about the same as each other. Doing both does get us sort of stacked performance in Sniper Elite 4, where we gain almost equal amounts from each aspect of the overclock, which really speaks to how the game works as opposed to a lot of the other games on the market. For Destiny 2, it's not quite as exciting, and Superposition, we have a bit more headroom and less of the diminishing returns than we saw with Firestrike. So they all have slightly different behaviors, but not that different. And fortunately with this card, you're not too often in a position where you're wondering, should I overclock A versus B? Because you run into other stability or thermal limitations before you run into those types of limitations. So again, this is all sort of academic exercises. It's a look at this new architecture, Volta, and how it performs under different conditions with clocks, thermals, noise, all of that stuff. Uh, so we can start to form a picture of where NVIDIA is going for the future. Now it's our present understanding that what we're seeing here, not even just the tensor cores wise, but what we're seeing here as a whole in Volta is probably going to be at least somewhat changed in name for the future architectures for gaming. Now, uh, how much it changes architecturally, how much it changes underneath, whether these are two different architectures developed in tandem or whether they're taking Volta, stripping out the tensor cores and then providing a gaming architecture with greater efficiency, we're not sure. The sort of expectation would be that Volta, where it appears inefficient, which would be in terms of power to performance in gaming, should improve when it becomes whatever it becomes for the gaming cards because there's all these items in this card, floating point 64 vectors, there's tensor flow processors, that do nothing for games except sit there and take up space on the die. And that's not great for efficiency. So we would expect that that particular aspect would improve for the gaming generation cards. As far as the rest of the behavior though, this gives us some idea as to what's going on. It is an async future it looks like uh, from what we're seeing from the data thus far. And that'll be the first time Nvidia is making a big push there. So we'll see what happens, but the next thing to do is probably the hybrid mod, see how much more we can get out of the clocks because right now we're thermal limit and uh, power limit colliding at this point. So hopefully we can fix some of that. Maybe a shunt mod, we'll see. Thank you for watching as always. Keep an eye out for Buildzoid's content coming up soon on this channel, which will be a PCB and VRM analysis. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net slash modmat if you want to pick up a mod mat like this one. So we just spent a lot of time working on this. It has a plug that connects to a common ground point which connects to your wrist and then to a ground pin in the wall. So everything is anti-static free, pretty high quality materials and it has quick reference cheat sheets printed on it. Or you can just subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.